What typically happens in cases like this is, uh, I'm not good with this mic here, so we'll, we'll leave, give it the best shot, is, is uh, my good brother Mark has done what's called shotgun. He just loads it up and he just pulls the trigger as many times as he can and he, in hopes to you know, confuse everybody. By the looks on your faces, I'm going to say that's pretty much what happened the, the, through this. There's, there's some confusion, no question about that. However, what we're looking at is Scripture. We're not going to talk about what the Catholics believe in all of their 1st century, 2nd century, 3rd century theologians, which is what Brother Mark did. And I want to address some of those things that were talked about in his uh, first 30 minutes. He said that the voice of history says that they were all looking forward to a, a uh, future, a, a, a futuristic coming of Christ. Well, look at this. We can go through here. We can look at their own words that, um, that as a matter of fact, this is kind of interesting. Philip Morrow, I won't uh, bother reading through this, but he helped prepare the, the briefs for the Scopes Monkey Trial. He actually said, I mean, look at the things that he said here. He said, the people do not seem to be aware of the immense significance of the destruction of Jerusalem and all of these things and the past fulfillment of predicted events. This is in the 20s. And here's an intelligent man a lawyer, and he says, I see this. I don't know to exactly to what extent, but in A.D. 62, James, the brother of Jesus, was quoted as saying, Why do you ask me concerning Jesus, the Son of Man? He himself sits in the heaven at the right hand of the great power and is about to come on the clouds of heaven. That's in 62. So you know what? We can go back through history and we can do the same thing that Mark did. In 100, we can look at the Odes of Solomon because he is my son and his rays have lifted me up and his light hath dispelled all darkness from my face. In him I have acquired eyes and I have seen his holy day. They're talking about things that happened in the past. They're a recent past. And we could go on and on and there's, there's much more. Origen said the entire Jewish nation was destroyed less than one whole generation later on the account of the sufferings and so forth. And we can just go on and on and on through these things, but I'm not going to do this. What I want to talk about are some things that have quite a bit more weight. Maybe we can do this and take the time that we have to do these things. And, and bring up a couple other things that I know you all have questions about. And this is just going to take a whole lot of time to do, so we're just going to jump right into this. You know, he was talking about Irenaeus. Let's talk about Irenaeus and how reliable Irenaeus was. Irenaeus was the one that everybody builds their argument for the late date of Revelation. Well, in fact, he called it an ancient copy. So is it an early copy? Is it an ancient copy? What is it? Was it at his time or was it much earlier than his time? He also said that Jesus lived until he was 50 years old. Certainly, Irenaeus is not a reliable uh, source. And what we see, in lots, of, lots of things we can see here through this, is the simple fact that the book of Revelation was written before 70. Notice what it says here. Let's, we make mention of this in Revelation 11. Let's go over here and look at this. Notice what he says. He was told to get up and measure the altar. This is Revelation 11. 1. And those who worship in it, Leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it for it has been given to the nations. That's the Gentiles. And they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. Well, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? Because we know that that's exactly what happened in history. So was this written afterwards? Are we, does Mark and uh, really even I taught this. Are we trying to make, pretend here that this was written after the fact to tell history? Or was he prophesying? We know that's exactly what was taking place. We can look here and they're going to tread under underfoot the holy city for 42 months. Well, what about Revelation 17? Revelation 17 makes it very clear that there were five kings. Now notice this. There were five kings 
There are five kings that have fallen. This is Revelation 17, verse 10. And one is. So at the time of this writing, five kings had, had passed away. Now listen to this. The first one was Julius, the second Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius. And guess what the sixth one was during the time of the writing of Revelation? Nero. We understand that Nero's name was Domitius. So we can see how it would be very easy for some translator or somebody in later times to look at what Irenaeus wrote and say, well, this must be Domitian and mistranslated. But the internal evidence tells us, did we forget about what we read? Notice what he said in the first chapter. He said, these are things that are written to who? To show his bondservants, chapter 1, verse 1, the things which must soon take place. How do you get around that? These things are soon to take place. Notice what he said in the third verse. The time is near. How do we get around those time statements? He says that these things are getting ready to take place. And then he closes it. This is this inclusio. He closes it in typical Hebraic fashion by making these bookends. So at the end of the book, what does he say? He says in Verse 7, Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. He says in verse 10, The time is near. Verse 12, I am coming quickly. How do you get around that? You're going to have to do an awful lot of sidestepping to get around these things. The simple fact of the matter is, he's just trying to convolute things. And that's what we've done because we don't want to accept what the Scriptures say. But we must accept what Jesus said. What about the early church fathers? He just quoted all of these guys, didn't quote scripture, to prove his point about the writings of the Bible. Well, here's a fun fact. Let's go over here to Zechariah chapter 13. I want to show you a couple of things here. In Zechariah chapter 13, notice here in the first verse, it says, In that day a fountain will be opened for the house of David, for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, for sin and impurity. And there's not probably not a preacher in the church of Christ that would ever say that this has, has nothing to do with the first century. We would agree on that. But notice what he says, It will come about in that day, declares the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols from the land. They will no longer be remembered. I will also remove the prophets and the unclean spirit from the land. And there's, he goes on here, he says, They are not going to prophesy. There's not going to be any unclean spirits. When is this going to happen? Chapter 12, verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Notice what he says in verse 2. Behold, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling to all peoples. When the siege is against Jerusalem, it would also be against Judah in that day. And he goes on in verse 3 to make sure that we understand it's all nations. This is the Olivet Discourse. This is what Jesus was talking about. But we don't look at these things. and we, we try to just simply say, well, you know, um, and we don't answer it. There's the answer. When, was the, when were these things going to take place? In that day. Now, we go to Matthew chapter 24, and we're looking through Matthew 24, and what does Matthew 24 teach us? Jesus used His own words to talk to the people in that time, and He said, these things apply to you. Notice what He said in the 23rd chapter. Notice what he says in verse 34. Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some you will kill and crucify, and you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon who you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of Zacharias, a um, righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah. When was he saying these things? Who are they going to fall on? Them. Notice what he says. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Well, it didn't address that. Because he begins the argument with these things happening to this generation. He talks about it halfway through, this thing happening to this generation. And he continues talking about it. Have you ever thought about the trans supposed transition verse in verse 36? And he says in verse 36, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father alone. Have you ever thought about that? Well, this is the supposed transition verse, right? But do you realize that he's talking about resurrection before the transition verse? He's talking about it after the transition verse. And he's simply saying it's not that nobody knows. Let's go back to Zechariah. Zechariah, the 14th chapter. And what are we going to see in Zechariah? We're going to see that he says when these things are going to take place. What does he say about it? He says they're going to happen at a, at a certain time. When is that time? If you look at Zechariah 14, he's talking about this time exactly, and he pinpoints it 
Behold, verse 1, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil will be taken from you and divided from you, and I'll gather all nations against Jerusalem. What is this? This is after the transition verse. This is the gathering of the nations. And what, is, what does he say? Verse uh, 5, at the end of it, the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with Him. Verse 6, in that day there will be no light and the luminaries will dwindle, for it will be a unique day which is known to the Lord. So when is this unique day that's going to happen that's known to the Lord going to happen? We've read it there. 12, 13, and 14. When the siege is coming upon the city. Luke chapter 21 and verse 20. Jesus said, when you see the city surrounded with armies, um, get the point. Now surely they would have got in the first century because as Mark said, from what my understanding is, 60,000 of them fled to Pellet. But according to Josephus, I believe it was about 1.2 million died there because they were too stubborn to leave. And that's not counting the rebels, about 60 or 600,000 of them. So then not to mention all the ones who were taken into captivity. My point about it is the Lord knew when these things were going to happen. He said it was like a woman in travail. Now let's think about this. Go back over to Matthew chapter 24. He says this is like a woman in travail. Hmm. Well, how long... It, and I'm sure there's lots of ladies in here who can answer this question. How long is a woman in, in uh, well, what's the gestation here? It's 40 weeks. So what was the time from the time Jesus died until the time of the culmination of the ages? 40 years. <clears throat> Jesus is really pointing something out here. Notice this in Matthew chapter 24, 8. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. You go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and verse 3. It's the same thing. What are these birth pangs? Well, I remember three times racing to the hospital with my wife, and I didn't know that exact hour. Just like when Noah didn't know that exact hour. Well, let's look at Noah. Turn over here to Genesis chapter... Well, we're going to look at 7 and 8 here. But Genesis chapter 8 specifically. Now, let's, let's do this. Genesis 7, the flood first. Okay, so here's Noah. And Jesus said, it's going to be just like in the days of Noah. Well, what was it like in the days of Noah? So Noah goes out and finds this great big field, and he starts building a big ark in this big field. So what happens? People look at him and say, well, there's just another ark being built. Well, no. It was the only ark there, and this was a sign. It was a sign. Just like in the days of Noah. Now, look at this. Genesis chapter 7, and verse 4, For after seven more days, the Lord said, I will send rain on the earth. Then he said it's going to rain 40 days and 40 nights and so on. So what happened? Noah was put into that ark. The door was shut. And he had to wait until the rain started. Did you on, do we honestly want to say that he knew or believed or thought that that soon coming or this time where he shut in the ark and the Lord told him it's going to start raining was going to be 2,000 years in the future? It doesn't make sense. Here's your sign. This big ark out in the middle of a field where there's never been rain. And here's Noah telling people it's going to rain. And they look at him like he's crazy. The Lord closed that door and guess what happened? Well, when he closed the door and it rained, then all of a sudden they come... Well, not all of a sudden, but a little while later. Fast forward to Genesis chapter 8. Notice what Genesis 8 says that Brother Mark left out. God loved him so much, as much as I do. Notice here in verse 20. Genesis chapter 8. It says that Noah built an altar to the Lord and took every clean animal and every... Uh, clean bird and so on. So we know what's going on. He, he built this this uh, uh, sacrifice, made the sacrifice. And notice what verse 21 says. The Lord smelled the soothing aroma, and the Lord said to him, I will never again curse the ground on account of man. What did he mean? I'll never again curse the ground on account of man? Oh, but what this means is he's not going to destroy every living thing as he has done. He's not going to do it with water. No, he's going to be meaner the next time. He's going to burn everybody up. This does not make sense, does it? It certainly doesn't make sense. And he says, while the earth remains, what he's actually saying here, Brother Mark, is the earth is going to remain. I'm not going to curse it on the account of, uh, of man. Because every thought and intent of man's heart is evil from his youth, and I'll never again destroy every living thing as I have done. He wasn't talking about with water. He was talking about destroying every living thing. How do you get around that? He said, I'm not going to destroy every living thing. I think that's a pretty good question. I like how Brother Mark made a few of our points for us, and I'd like to discuss one or two, if I get a moment to do this. 
I had so many other things I wanted to say. 20 minutes is just not enough. But he was using the day of the Lord to illustrate our point for us. So Mark was talking about all these passages and he put them up there for me. I appreciate that a lot. And he illustrated how judgment came on all these different places and these different peoples. And guess what happened? There was fire. There was smoke. The earth was shattering and shaking. There was clouds and the Lord coming down on a chariot. Guess what? That's exactly the same language, the apocalyptic language, the day of the Lord language, letting Scripture interpret Scripture. That's that exact same language that is used in, guess where? 2 Peter 3. Let's go over here and look at this. 2 Peter 3. Not to mention, not to mention 2 Peter 3. Peter said, this is prophecy concerning you. This is going to happen to you. Let's see if we can go through this quick enough. And I know I'm going to run out of time to do this. We'll do the best that we can. But he says here, Know this, first of all, in the last days, mockers will come that they're mocking and following after their own lusts, saying, Where is the promise of His coming? So Peter's been preaching this, and the other have been preaching this for nearly 40 years, and someone pipes up and says, Hey, wait a minute. You've been saying this for nearly 40 years. Well, when's it going to happen? So what does Peter say? Remember, I told you to go back and read what I wrote before. These prophecies were for you. 1 Peter 1 and verse 10. They're pertaining to you. Remember that. Put it in its proper context. Ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was. But when they maintain this, it escapes their notice by the Word of God. The heavens existed long ago. The earth was formed out of water, by water, through water, which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But by His Word, the present heavens and earth are being preserved for fire. What is this present heavens and earth? It's not anything physical. And he says that. We read about that. What is it? The heavens and the earth. This old covenant. Jesus said it. And if you don't believe that, that Jesus didn't... If you think that Jesus did not know and understand what heavens and earth means, go back and study. All the preachers in here, go back and study John 5. What is He talking about? He said heavens and earth. And He used that terminology in there. And then about seven or eight times, what did He do? He said... The law of Moses said this, but I say to you. He was using the law of Moses in the terminology of heavens and earth. And it's not going to pass away. The heavens and earth are not going to pass away until everything, every T is crossed, every I is dotted. Then it will pass away. If that's the case. We're still under the old law. But notice this. He says in verse 10, The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. That's the exact same language that Brother Mark was pointing out. Notice what he said here. That the elements, look at Hebrews 5, verse 12. The elements are referred to as what? The Old Covenant. The Law of Moses. So how do we get around that? How do we look at, if we're going to let Scripture interpret Scripture, and we're not going to read our commentaries, we're going to let Scripture interpret Scripture. How do we get around going back to the Old Testament like Jesus commanded us to figure out what these things mean? How are we going to get around that? We're going to keep looking to our commentaries. Pull your Zer commentaries off, off your bookshelf. They're probably getting dusted because we stopped reading them because we memorized them. It's not the way the Lord's church is intended to be. Hebrews 8 and verse 13. Notice what he said. He said, Mark just totally, totally misquoted this. A new covenant has been made. And he made the first one obsolete. But whatever's becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. Well, you look at Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 36. And you're going to see something that I think will amaze you. And you understand, notice what he says. That this, that this verse uh, 36, he says, If this fixed order departs from me before me, declares the Lord... The offspring of Israel will also cease from being a nation before me forever. They will not cease being a nation until this fixed order departs. When did that fixed order depart? Notice what he says, verse 27. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll sow the seed. He says, I've watched over them to pluck and to break down. He says, verse 30, everyone who will die for his own iniquity. Days are coming, my new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So one covenant disappears and a new one begins. But don't you think for a minute, if you were living in Jerusalem in the first century as a Jew, as Paul did in Acts 21, you still would not be following the law. It says he was following it to the letter in Acts 21. How do you get around that? 
How do we get around Paul following the law? I don't know. We're going to have to make something up. We're going to have to see things that aren't there. We're going to have to redefine things. We're going to have to say things that are not there in order to get there. I'm not willing to do that. Let Scripture interpret Scripture. I know I'm about 20 seconds out, so... About 13, 12. I appreciate this. We've got plenty more to talk about. I didn't have enough time to make any more points. <coughs> Again, you didn't want to listen to my nesty sound again. <laughs> <laughs>